Good morning, everybody. It is May 29th, 2020, and the COVID stock market sweatpants rally continues. Uh, the market is actually down just a touch today, uh, but we've been hitting some pretty good resistance levels and going through them. So who knows how far the stock market can run. Uh, it doesn't look like it should be running based on all the economics, which we'll go through today. Um, and even the technical indicators are ambivalent to bad. The only thing that's uh, working is price. So the question becomes, at what point do all of the leading indicators lead and price follow? We should learn when we learn. Uh, I would think that uh, we are getting real close to this correction uh, that I've been anticipating happening. And we'll go through some reasons why. Again, our thesis that we've been following, be a bad year this year to economically, some lingering economic weakness with the potential for stagflation next year, or even late this year, and then the economy finally starts to recover as people become confident, and again, so another word that we'll touch on today, confident um, that their health and their finances are good. The curve is still not bent. We want to see the death curve, the number of deaths go basically horizontal, not happening yet. The slight turning over here represents New York City. New York City has been uh, pretty successful in bringing their deaths down uh, under 100 per day right now. And hopefully they get that down to close to zero per day uh, as soon as possible. But again, we wanna see this curve go sideways. There's been an uptick in daily deaths across the country as we've reopened in the last few weeks, um, and that's just very recent. So we'll see if this is the reality or if this is the reality. Again, I think we'll know within one to two weeks that will lead the market. The stock market has been relying on this to keep coming down. And if it reverses course and starts going up, stock market won't be happy. These are the projections from MIT that we've been following, and they've been pretty spot on. Um, we have gotten to the 100,000 mark for deaths ahead of schedule by about a month, um, but that was within their frame. So we're, we're, we're basically at the upper bound of what they projected. So that's that's bad. Um, they're projecting 200,000 by September 1st. Uh, but again, we're we're near the upper bound, and they are hoping for some success on keeping this um, level on the daily scale. And again, we're starting to see it tick up uh, on the chart that we just looked at a second ago. So again, the next week or two will be pretty telling. The uh, reproduction number, which we've talked about in recent months, we wanna keep that below one. And it looks like we're flirting with one right now. So does that number go up? If it does, that's bad. If it stays the same, then we basically have the same type of economy that we have right now. And if it goes down, then things probably start to improve. That, that, that reproduction rate is really important to keep an eye on. So if you're gonna follow one indicator, um, besides deaths, this would be the one. So I have these up here. Again, we do know that the uh, coronavirus deaths are undercounted according to the CDC and um, National Health Institute. 
again, there's a lot of hype out there. We just saw that Moderna um, has been under some fire for uh, uh, raising sh money and then k having executives cash out. I warned about that ahead of time that these uh, small companies putting out headlines um, were just, you know, it's, it's, it's a way for them to raise money. And they're still all long shots to have their vaccine get to market. And it's very unlikely anybody makes a lot of money on the, on the vaccine. This is a chart we looked at a while back. Uh, Moderna's RNA uh, approach. Um, the benefit is that they can probably get it to market quicker than most. Uh, however, um, this type of vaccine, I don't believe has ever been approved before. Nothing on this platform. So um, these are what we would normally um, expect for types of vaccines. So we'll see. Um, GlaxoSmithKline or AstraZeneca? I think it was AstraZeneca um, is gearing up to be able to, build, to do 300 million doses next year uh, to potentially a billion. So everybody's gearing up that once we have a vaccine, it will get produced probably within 90 days and then distributed the three to six months following. So if we get, um, and I've anticipated that we would get it by the end of the year, if we have a vaccine that's at phase three by the end of the year, and they're just going through the health efficacy, um, I still think the second half of 2021, we should be doing vaccines. Again, I'm optimistic. Uh, there's a lot of people saying, hey, that's never been done before, so just keep that in mind. And, and I, it's a very valid point. Uh, we want to remain cautious. This this uh, slide is from a month ago. So I would say, um, you know, we're in that six to eight week window that I talked about, that we should have been social distancing. And since we stopped, not stopped, but loosened up, um, we'll see if the curves go the correct direction. Here's some stats. Unemployment, over 2 million claims again this week. Continuing claims are still well above 20 million. Um, and we have to remember that PPP loans, um, are be, they're applying, those businesses are applying for forgiveness right now. So once they get their forgiveness, they're free to lay people off again. We should expect more layoffs. The question becomes, is will the falling continuing claims offset the new claims? We'll find out. I suspect that unemployment is going to be very high all year, and ultimately that um, causes uh, people to start cashing in their 401ks. Again, employment, the ISM employment index, started the turnover in 2018. So this is not a new phenomenon that we were starting to see manufacturing get beat up and then it just fell off a cliff recently. Average hours worked, spiking down. So this is worse than everything except this recession. And this recession is something that I remember as a kid. This is when almost all the men in my family lost their jobs at Alice Chalmers and American Can and other places. So this was when American manufacturing really got hit, when the economy started to change, 1981. Um, and since then we've had periodic corrections, but really not the greatest trend to begin with. Now we have manufacturing jobs falling off a cliff again. So we're going to need to see major um, improvement here and it's going to be difficult. New orders off a cliff. 
This is probably as bad as it gets, right? So it should start heading back, but just because it'll start to rise soon, you know, probably within a month or two, you know, how do we get it back up to this level? Right? Got a lot of ground to make up. It's going to take time. Same thing. You know, just to get up to this area, it's going to be a challenge. And then to be booming, you know, and this was largely tax cut induced. But to get up to this area, it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, at least two years, probably three, I think. New home permits have been growing, fell off a cliff. That's a combination of people hunkering down and um, shortage of labor. So I would expect this to resume. One of the reasons I'm positive on home builders throughout the 2020s is because we do need to see this curve keep going up. There's just not enough new house inventory out there um, and I believe that COVID-19 is going to cause a lot of people not to want to live in confined areas, um, condos, apartments, things like that, that are in city centers. I think you're going to see people continue to spread out, which means more new homes. And clearly, there are a lot of cities that need um, a lot of major rehabs or teardowns and rebuilds. Money supply has gone through the roof, coinciding with the Federal Reserve um, balance sheet. You can barely see that, but it's pretty much straight up. Uh, something to keep in mind is that we shouldn't normalize in our heads all these lines that are going straight up and straight down. This is extremely abnormal and we would expect at least reasonably expect the damage to be severe. So the question is, is, can a lot of money stimulate growth if people are afraid of going out? Consumer confidence has fallen off a cliff. And I think that as unemployment lingers, that will continue to get worse. Like we saw in 2008 and 9, it didn't snap right back, chopped around for a while. It really took uh, two years to start ramping back. And I think that's probably going to be consistent here, about two years. <clears throat> so I wouldn't expect the economy to shut down again the way it did. But I do expect the phase one to take a long time. I think getting people to um, congregate again is going to be uh, vaccine dependent. Um, so even though you're allowed to go places, um, a lot of places have restrictions on how many people. And I think that most people, surveys and, and polls are saying around two thirds of people are real cautious about being around others especially people they don't know. Um, I'm in that group. I suspect a lot of you are in that group. So we shouldn't expect economic activity to come back fast. So why is the stock market doing so well here? And there's a lot of theories. Um, I think the main one is that the Fed is facilitating this and that there are a lot of people who are sitting in front of computers now thinking that they're all-star traders. And one of the lessons that I've learned in the 90s and before the dot-com crash, and I've, I've discussed when I was at the um, money show and traders' uh, um, uh, exposition, in New York City that the financial machine, the financial sales machine that is in this economy uh, to sell products and services uh, was really pushing ordinary inexperienced people on the hopium that they could become all-star traders. 
And there are a lot of people, younger people in particular, who I'm watching make the same mistakes that were made 12 and 20 years ago. They are believing that they are all-star traders um, because right now they're up. And we'll see how the phenomena of um, young investors works out. It's never worked out well for them. Um, they usually uh, take it in the shorts at some point. And I would think this would be no different. Uh, a lot of people got hurt um, during the first crash. Uh, then they became buyers and now they feel like they're really smart. And maybe they are really smart, but the stock market eats people up and it does it over and over and over again. I don't think this will be any different. Um, the most dangerous words in finance are this time it's different, right? Maybe it's different this time. When it's finally different, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'm not holding my breath. The only questions that I really see are which resistance level turns the stock market back? And I think it'll be the resistance level that happens to be around if COVID deaths start to go back up or if unemployment stays um, stubbornly high. So let's suppose COVID deaths move sideways. Maybe the market doesn't fall, feel too bad about that. It should, but maybe it won't. So then it becomes a case of when do people start feeling desperate financially? And typically that's after two or three months of being unemployed. Um, most people um, cannot handle unemployment longer than two or three months. Think about how tough, I mean, we got, we got protests from folks who supposedly were doing all right uh, after less than two months to re reopen the economy. So, uh, you know, I think that we should be real careful about thinking that this can't reverse. Now, if you want to trade because you think that there's money to be made here, have at it. You know, we talk about those ideas at Fundamental Trends in the chat room. Um, I'm not particularly bullish, um, but, you know, I have some rules. Uh, one of the rules is try to be in a couple of the best things, and we've been in gold. Um, have a little bit of legacy holdings. And there are several, you know, dividend stocks out there paying 6 7 8% that I think are worthwhile. I think AT&T doesn't have any real permanent downside. I think Kinder Morgan, because it's a natural gas pipeline versus the oil um, company, you know, I think Kinder Morgan has a very limited downside. Um, store Capital, which is a retail real estate read, people say, oh, well, I don't want that. Well, here's the thing. Those are the types of stores that open to the outside. Those are strip malls. So you're indoor malls are the ones that are going to be in trouble, like Simon Properties, and your outdoor strip malls where people can walk in and there's open air um, doorways, uh, those are the ones that are probably going to do well. Plus, those are usually very good pieces of property and very easy to rehab or change because they're just box buildings, easy to tear down, easy to slap up. Giant mall, that's a lot of work to rehab or remodel or tear down and then, re and, then, and then rebuild. So you have to take a look at the expense structure of the business. So Kinder Morgan, AT&T, Store Capital, all paying good dividends, limited downside, you know, really not a lot of permanent risk, right? Even if there's a correction, they'll come back and you collect the dividend the whole time. So those are three stocks that I think you can sell cash secured puts on right now. If you want to get more involved in equities, sell cash secured puts a little bit below the money, collect some premium, and then if it gets put to you 
um, you know, you have, a, you have a good company paying a big dividend. And in the meantime, the premium for over the next few months be higher than what the dividend would have been if you had bought the stock outright. So you can essentially create your own dividend without having to own the stock. And if you do own the stock, it'll be lower in price when you get it. So I think cash secure puts on store capital, um, AT&T and Kinder Morgan are pretty good deals right now. As we take a look at where these support and resistance areas are, we're just entering another one right now, right? Um, at 301 area we hit and we got all the way up to 306. This is a range where if it doesn't break through here, the 306 area, um, then it probably starts to head down. And the question becomes is does it just have a little mini correction or does it have this one, which I think is more likely. It's a big confluence of levels that usually indicate a, a target area. And then this one, you know, it's the bottom of a, range, of a range of ranges before you have a big gap down. And if we have the big gap down, that's usually because there's something bad going on. So it could go pretty far down. So if we go from here to here to here to here, and it looks like we're going to break through here, um, something bad is going on. So we should be aware of what the bad things could be, right? So let's talk a little bit about the Armageddon scenario that I brought up. Um, was that? Two weeks ago. So we have this article here where I talk about different scenarios. Uh, the first scenario is that we are basically um, in a new bull market and that we would only expect a small correction, one of these. And if we're in a new bull market, then we want to be buyers in these areas, at least our favorite things, right? So if somebody's asking me, what are the probability ranges for the S&P getting down to 290 to 260? First of all, that is actually a bad question, and I'll explain why that's a bad question. There's no way to place probabilities on any of this stuff. I think that's where people get it wrong. All you can do is measure what is the potential upside and the potential downside. And the potential upside in the next year or two is probably to new highs and then another 20 or 30%. So let's suppose that the S&P 500 can get to 4,000. That's about a 30% gain. I'd say that's the upside. The downside is that we see, you know, well under 200 on the SPY. That's a 30% downside. Um, and I think that there's potential for you know, 16, 1700, that'd be 40% downside. And then the Armageddon scenario, which I want to talk about now, uh, is that, you know, we could see, you know, a 60% 60, 60 drop from here. And, and that's historically not something that's unlikely. It's just something that's not super likely, right? It's within the range of possibilities. So if we're in a new bull market, Despite all the economics, if printing money can do that, even if people are out of work and not contributing to their 401k or a 401k, and even if people are cashing in 401k plans, then you're no longer in a free market. You know, I think it was questionable to begin with over the last 12 years. 
and, and, and you shouldn't really even consider yourself a capitalist. You just just think of yourself as a, as trying to be a better gambler than the next one. Because if they completely get rid of price discovery, which they're pushing in that direction with all the Fed programs, then why don't we just become socialist? Right? Why don't we just become socialist if we're never ever going to let there be actual price discovery? And the answer why we don't just go socialist because eventually then we just have a 20 year depression. Because that's what happens to socialists. Go talk to any country that really has gone down that road and that doesn't happen to have a, a, a ton of oil money. Every company country that's ever gone socialist, if they didn't have major oil money, it's been the only thing, oil money. They've, they've gone through generation-long depressions. So if we're in a new bull market, then we want to buy at those levels that we just looked at. If we're going to get a second wave of the coronavirus, which seems pretty likely, I'd, I'd say probably in that 90% range, um, likely, then we're going to have to consider how that impacts the economy so restart. And I would think that the restart is going to be slow no matter what until there's a vaccine. Um, but if we get a second wave, um, then you're going to see more and more employers just make the decision to shut down for two or four weeks all by themselves. And at that point, either the government steps in again to keep people employed uh, with some sort of a program like PPP, or they just go unemployed. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. I've been talking about zombie companies in the S&P 500 for what now? Six months? If you've been following the headlines, what is the word that everybody's throwing out now? Zombie companies. I'm telling you, we are so freaking far ahead of everybody else that the only thing that we haven't done great is try to chase the market. And if you bought a bunch of gold and I said to take a very big position, it doesn't even matter. You're probably keeping roughly up with the market with way less risk. The opportunity cost of sitting in cash is pretty low right now because the risk in the stock market is extremely high. The put to call ratio is about 0.5 right now. That always pretends a correction. That's one of those smart money, stupid money indicators. So all the smart money, stupid money indicators are showing that the smart money is not too involved here and the stupid money is splashing around. You know I play poker? I wait for stupid players to start splashing around in the pot. I show them bad cards to get them to play more hands. That's what's going on here. I don't even think it's that hard to recognize. The only question is, is there a few more ticks up? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. There's a lot of money out there that the Fed is printing, although Almost all of it has gone into the bond market. Jeffrey Gunluck has talked about that. And what Gunluck said is that LQD is starting to become overvalued already because he expects a lot more bankruptcies. So you've got one of the bond kings in America saying, hey, yeah, it's great that the Fed bailed these guys out, but there's still going to be a whole bunch of bankruptcies. So I'm not even sure how long I want to hold LQD. You know, now that I'm up whatever it is, four or five percent, 
in a couple of weeks. You know, I still like that Fallen Angel one, but I would think that as those discount, as as these all as the bond funds match their highs, right? As they get back to their highs, you maybe I'm a little early selling at that point, um, but I don't know that I want to take much risk, given that we saw what those bond funds can do when there's a shock. So you really just want to close the gap back to the high then I don't think you want to hold on to those much longer, right? Unless you're a very long-term investor, and it's just a core to your portfolio. In which case, you'll just live with the volatility when those shocks happen. And, and you'll expect that the Fed will do something when those shocks happen. If you're a little bit more tactical, you know, you'll take your profits soon. So it really depends on your time frame. If you if you just need fifteen percent of your portfolio um, to grind out, you know, a, a dividend rate, and as long as the long term principle is intact, you don't even care about appreciation, then those bond funds are fine. But if the volatility bothers you, or you want to try to trade the volatility, or just be in a better spot. You know, you have to make that decision for yourself too. I think I'm going to sell these bond funds relatively soon because I believe that the stock market comes down when it bring those bond funds down too. And I want to have cash when that happens. So to me, these bond funds, for most people are trades. Yeah, I got a handful of accounts where they should hold on to them long term. Um, but I really think that gold and gold stocks offer me the diversification and lack of correlation that I'm looking for versus bonds. And I certainly don't want government bonds because when they finally admit that they've printed money, right? When they change the way the, the ledger looks, you know, at that point, interest rates go up. So once government admits what it's been doing, you know, instead of pretending that it's doing something else, um, you know, it's just a delayed, this is, this is helicopter money, but the announcement that it's helicopter money won't come for a long time, probably when they do another program. The Armageddon scenario. So what did we say the factors for the Armageddon scenario were? A wicked second wave of coronavirus. Clearly that's possible. And with 18 states trending up, that's what it is now. 18 states are trending up on infections and deaths. And states like Wisconsin and, and, and another 15 or so going sideways. Pretty easy to see the second wave could be pretty wicked. Um, if summertime doesn't break it up for us, we're probably in just a world of hurt. It'll go from bad to really, really bad. What if government, because the elections perhaps, can't get a lot more relief out this year? What if the Federal Reserve finally is pushing on a string? And what if there's a trade conflict that disrupts global supply chains and global demand? Can you see any of those things happening? Are they happening right now? I think it would take an awful lot of faith to believe that suddenly coronavirus is going to tail off and that the Federal Reserve can just keep printing money and have it be effective. I mean, certainly they can keep printing money, but at what point does it not matter? And is there going to be another relief bill to support Main Street and clearly bail out the markets? Maybe, maybe not, right? Maybe not until things get really bad. What incentive does either party have 
to do anything preemptively? Not much, right? And what we're seeing with China is that everything's getting ratcheted up again. And, and it's both sides' fault. You know, what the Chinese are doing with uh, Hong Kong is clearly a power grab. It's opportunistic. And the uh, U.S. hasn't handled it well for three years. So now we have that all coming to a head. A long time ago, I wrote an article that said this is President Trump's economy now. I think you should go back and read that. Will President Trump trade us into a recession? I expected positive surprises on Trump's trade policy, and we got it. Let's do this the hard way. So back when he appointed uh, Chairman Powell and he got his tax bill through, that was pretty much the end of the Obama era. And, it, and in, in early 2018, the economy became President Trump's. Let's go back and look at Look, why, why did it start doing this? Were those policies really that good? I talked about for years, right? How good were those policies? How good were those policies? I think people need to jump into reality that the tax cuts were effectual, right? It caused an asset wave and then turned over pretty quick. This is all pre-coronavirus, right? That turning over is pre-coronavirus. So the economy always was on thin ice because you can't pour money on the top and expect it to really trickle down because there's so many cups in the way, especially the great big buckets at the top. As investors, we need to be very cognizant of the fact that there's a lot of people, 60-ish to 80-ish percent of folks who just can't hack being out of work 90 days. They don't have the financial ability to do it. Probably closer to 60%. So I would agree that this is a bear market rally. Like in the Great Depression, there was a couple of great big rallies. And in 2008, in 2009, there were two great big rallies. So we should expect another wave down. The question becomes timing and magnitude. And will we find attractive valuation levels? When we talk about valuations, just throw out this year. And I think we can almost throw out next year. So the question becomes is, at what point does GDP and corporate profits, what year does that match 2019? I think it's an outside chance that happens in 2022, but probably not. Probably looking at 2023 for earnings to get back to where they were. 
And are people going to stay invested in the next three years just to get back to par? So remember I told you that um, if you're looking to open a business, you should look to do it soon because you get a great deal on rents and buying real estate. That's already started to happen. My daughter is taking a spot in downtown Milwaukee for her salon, tripling her floor space, maybe quadrupling it, and getting the space for about 15% less than what they were asking on an extended lease, so her expenses are fairly stable. And she upgraded her location by magnitudes. And now she can have people rent from her. So I think that there's a lot of people who are going to see this and, and they're not gonna go back to work. They're gonna open their own business, which is good for the economy but how does, that hand, how does that work with the stock market? Most people who open a business, they don't invest money in the stocks the first couple of years, right? They're just getting, they're pouring all their money into growing their businesses. We're going to go through a very long, hard, drawn out rebuilding phase, two, three years for sure. From the time that we feel like, hey, nothing's gonna kill us. COVID-19 is the leading cause of death in America right now. Higher than heart attacks and cancer at the moment. And, and they're about, it's about to cross back down under that, hopefully. But, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a big killer. And it looks like there's four to 500,000 people with chronic conditions from it now in the United States. Lease conditions that are going to require maintenance for a year or longer. So the idea that COVID-19 doesn't kill young people, yeah, that's mostly true. Uh, but it is leaving some marks. So as younger people start to see friends who now have to do kidney dialysis or take medications or go to a doctor over and over again, they're going to start to go, hmm, maybe I shouldn't be at that party. Maybe I shouldn't be at that crowded place, right? There's this invincibility among young people. We've all had it. But then something wakes us up. We go, ooh, maybe I don't want to take that risk. So don't anticipate that any of this is going to be fast. It's going to be choppy. There's going to be another stock market correction, I think, soon. You know, I've been saying May. You know, I guess it could be June. But, uh, you know, I don't think you're taking a lot of risk by being very conservative right now. And I think you're taking a ton of risk if you're aggressive. So understand that if you are 70, 80, 90% in equities, just understand your risk level. Your risk level is that you can wake up one day on a bad report to a stock market that's down 2,000 points. Don't think it can't happen. We just saw it. Don't have short-term selective memory. Right? So, all right. I'll call it a day. Um, as you've seen, I put out some articles about selling puts, about selling cover calls. Uh, go ahead and in the chat rooms or at Seeking Alpha on Margin of Safety Investing, go ahead and ask questions right below there. And I will answer questions about what I'd be looking for for calls, durations, and strike prices, and any stocks that you want to ask about. So if you have stocks in your portfolios, uh, especially at Margin of Safety, um, go ahead and say, hey, I own this, this, and this. Which covered calls would you, you know, what direction would you look for covered calls? Just go ahead and put those questions in there and I will go through them over the weekend and answer. And then Monday, Tuesday, you know, you can write some cover calls. All right, have a great weekend, everybody.